Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> uh, the next talk in this session will be given by Tobias Miklips, uh, and he will talk about the quantum physical walk at the end of the transition. Okay, first I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this very nice event. So uh, I will talk about this quantum critical walk at the topology and Anderson localization transition. That is a work done together with Dima Bagritz and Alex Halton from Cologne. And I will also put this in a broader context, also report on some work that was also done uh, involving Kurt Müller. And uh, so we also have some more recent results involving Markus Marinius, uh, a student from BPF. So the motivation for the talk here is given actually by some uh, very nice uh, experiments which allow to, to study in a very controlled way uh, disorder and quantum systems. So we have heard uh, already several interesting examples of quantum simulators um, where mainly the focus was more on the antacting side. So here I will talk about uh, two examples uh, which don't involve any interaction. So it's really about the single particle physics in a disordered system. So on the one hand I'll talk about uh, uh, um, um, some uh, work that was motivated by some called it a quantum quench experiment, uh, which allows to, to study endless localization in a very nice way. And then I'll turn to the uh, recent work, which we hopefully finish soon, which is uh, motivated by a photon experiment, and where we hope that one can study the critical dynamics at a topology endless localization transition. So let me first start out then with the quantum quench experiment that was done a couple of years ago in the group uh, by Alain Spee and what they did in this experiment, they trapped their cold atoms in, 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 an, in an optical trap and then um, gave the cloud of cold atoms initial kick. So they prepared a cloud of cold atoms where the cold atoms have a well-defined initial momentum K0. And then in the ex actual experiment what they do is they release this cloud of cold atoms with a well-defined initial momentum from the optical trap suspended against gravity by, by magnetic levitation, and then switch on some uh, uh, laser speckle disorder potential, which in their case was uh, to mimic two-dimensional disorder. So it's elongat elongated along one axis. And then in the uh, actual quench experiment, they just let evolve this cloud of cold atoms with a well-defined initial momentum K0 for some time t in the disorder speckle, after which they switch off um, the disorder and just take a snapshot of the momentum distribution and what they are uh, looking for then in this experiment is just correlations between the final and the initial momentum and it said before so all this here is about single particle physics so the, the experiment is done at low densities where uh, one can neglect uh, interactions between the particles. So let's just briefly uh, take a look what classically one would expect in such an experiment while well you start out from your cold atoms with a well-defined momentum, then uh, once you switch on the disorder potential, you have a lot of elastic scattering going on, you have uh, energy conservation, so in the two-dimensional system, the cold atom cloud will just redistribute over the energy shell, so after a couple of elastic scattering times, they will just have completely isotropically redistributed over the energy shell, uh, reflecting that classically you have a diffusion process, which is a Markovian process, so you do not keep any memory of the initial states and no momentum correlations build up. Now, if you look at the corresponding quantum uh, case, that's more interesting because uh, yeah, they have quantum interference going on, which means that the system can uh, keep some memory, and then what you're looking for is the momentum correlations that build up in time. So this is now showing the outcome of this experiment by the group of Alain SP. So you see here the experimental data, um, that's the distribution of the initial momentum, uh, uh, the, 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 the distribution of, of the initial state, so where all call, all call atoms occupy one momentum, and then after a few elastic scattering times, well, you see that most of the cold atoms redistribute over the energy shell, but at the same time, you see here a peak appearing in the, uh, in the backscattering direction. So you have a coherent peak into the backscattering direction. This is a very well-known uh, phenomenon. So this is just uh, another, let's say, um, a view of uh, the well-known weak localization correction in a weakly disordered metal. So here you have a low dimensional um, weakly disordered metal. Um, you have uh, a magnetic field here. At finite magnetic field, the conductance or conductivity is given by the Drude conductivity. However, at zero magnetic field, you have some quantum interference correction which reduce the conductivity. And uh, as you apply the magnetic field, you deface this quantum coherence correction and come to the classical Drude conductivity. And that's very well understood. While this comes 
if you think about the electrons diffusively propagating in your disordered metal, then there can be some paths which are self-intersecting. In such a self-intersecting path, you can now have uh, um, uh, interference going on, so you can have amplitudes for propagating along either way in this loop. This will lead to a, a constructive interference, which will uh, lead to an enhanced return probability and thereby re uh, reduce uh, the, the conductivity. Now, if you apply the magnetic field, you just deface uh, the, the, the amplitudes that say accumulated uh, or the phases accumulated while propagating in either, uh, along either direction of, of, of the loop and you suppress this interference correction. So if you look at this process in momentum space, then you see well that the momenta of the incoming and outgoing segments of the path are just anti-aligned. So this is just the uh, coherent backscattering peak. So this is very well known that this is a precursor of strong endless localization. So in their experiment, they could go to much longer times because at some uh, longer time scale, the third dimension became important. But what was done then was some numerical simulation of this quantum quench experiment. So this is shown here some uh, uh, results of this um, simulation. So here uh, you look, so this is increasing in time. So here you see the, uh, the distribution of the cold atoms after a few elastic scattering times. So most have redistribute over the energy shell and at the same time you already have the coherent backscattering peak. Now the interesting thing is that if you go to longer time scales, you see that a second peak arises which now appears in the forward scattering direction. And this actually can be also really understood if one thinks about these self-intersecting paths. Well, if you look at a contribution from a path that is twice self-intersecting, again, you will have a lot of constructive interference going on that will tend to localize the particle, reduce the conductivity. But here now, the, the segments, if you look at this in, in momentum space, well, the momentum are aligned, so explaining the Korean forward scattering peak. The interesting part here is that if you look at the time scale at which this Korean forward scattering peak builds up, then you recognize that it's a characteristic time scale at which, in this low dimensional system, strong endless localization builds up. That means once you expect that these two loop contributions become, become relevant, then actually you should look for all kinds of self-intersecting path of, let's say, higher loop orders. Um, and this just reflects the fact that you're then really entering the strong endless localization regime, which is, in a sense, non-perturbative. So this uh, is, I think, a very nice feature in this experiment, so at least in the simulation, that um, you have here cl clear like signals for uh, the coherent backscattering peak, which is a weak localization signature, and then the coherent forward scattering peak that builds up on a longer time scale, which is here than the, the signature of strong endless localization. So, um, well, I guess I can be quite brief here because this was discussed on, on in the previous talk. So here's just, I mean, recalling. So uh, here's just the, the single, um, um, the, um, the single parameter scale. So, so um, here shown the beta function for your weakly disordered system. So if you believe in a single parameter scaling hypothesis, meaning that the beta function, which tells you how the conductance of the system changes uh, as you increase the system size. So if, if you believe that this beta function just depends on a single parameter, which is the conductance, then you can work out, well, the, the, the beta function low dimension will find that it's always negative, meaning that in dimensions smaller than three, as you increase your system size, you will always flow to the endless and insulating fixed point. Um, so this was also explained nicely in the previous talk. So let me just add here that we have uh, also a field theoretical understanding um, for endless localization in terms of the nonlinear di sigma, diffuse, diffuses nonlinear sigma model, which is shown here. And which is described by some action in an um, effective degree of freedom, which knows about the endless localization, which in this case is some matrix field that lives on some uh, uh, manifold so group or some cusset space. And the action um, that describes the dynamics of this field is very similar to the standard Ginzburg Landau, Landau type of action. So here, compared to a magnet, one has uh, uh, the typical kinetic term, and then one has a symmetry, a symmetry breaking term in both types of actions. So in case of the magnet, this is just due to uh, some external magnetic field along which the spin wants to align. In case of the Anderson uh, or, or the, 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 um, the um, disordered uh, system, so your effective action also has a symmetry breaking term. So this lambda here is some uh, uh, matrix that represents the metallic fixed point. So if the symmetry breaking is strong, your fields want to stay close to the metallic fixed point, and um, 
And um, what in this case defines the strength of the symmetry breaking is uh, a frequency which measures it's the inverse of the time scale at which you look here at the dynamics uh, in the in the disordered low dimensional system. So, um, uh, and this time scale appears uh, is measured in in this characteristic time scale, so the Heisenberg time, um, at which now the forward scattering peak builds up. Uh, on the previous slide. So the statement then here is that now one can understand nicely uh, within this field theory um, the forward and scattering peak is describing the perturbative and non-perturbative regime. So if you're looking at short time scales, the symmetry breaking is strong, you can restrict or the, the, the your field degree of freedom stays close to the metallic fixed point, you can do a perturbative expansion around this in terms of the goldstone bosons, bolts which are just the diffuse modes, so you get classical diffusion and weak localization corrections. However, once you come to the longer time scales, then the symmetry breaking becomes weak. And uh, what you actually should then do is integrate over the entire uh, field manifold to, um, to get non perturbative results. And um, the nice thing then is that uh, we can do such non perturbative calculations using the field theory in quasi 1D systems. And actually the quasi 1D systems are also the interesting for the experiment because as said, um, they have some problems going to the long time scales at which uh, the forward scattering peak builds up. So you want to go to a lower dimension system, a quasi 1D system, where the characteristic time scale then is, is shorter, on which the, the, the strong endless localization builds up is smaller than in, in, in the 2D system. So that's then what we did. So this is showing here some results of some non perturbative calculations that we did. Uh, for the forward scattering peak. So this is showing here how the forward scattering peak builds up in time. And this is some recent result with a uh, very good student from CBPF, Marcus Marinho, where we did the calculation for all the three Wigner Dyson classes. This is here showing the result uh, in an orthogonal class where you have time reversal symmetry in the system. And uh, the points here are just uh, um, the results from, from some recent numerical simulations. So this is actually um, a comparison without fitting parameters, so we have a very nice analytical theory for the building up of this forward scattering peak. Um, and uh, if one looks a little bit closer at this forward scattering peak, how this builds up in time, one actually recognizes uh, a very familiar object because it is just uh, the, the, the temporal profile here is just a spectral form factor. So it's a Fourier transform of the level level correlation function. So if you have your disordered system, um, um, let's say at length scales much smaller than the localization length, then you just have Wigner Dyson statistics. Um, if you go to the opposite limit of a thermodyn uh, the thermodynamic limit, you just have your localized states far distance which do not speak to each other, so you would expect Poisson statistics. However, in a finite size Anderson insulator, you still have some residual level repulsion, and it's exactly those which are uh, like the Fourier transform, are those which you would measure in such a an experiment in the buildup of the forward scattering peak. So um, given that, then you can re readily understand also the asymptotic, let's say, form at short times and long times uh, of, of this forward scattering peak um, from some simple phenomenological models for strong endless localization or the level correlations in the finite size Anderson insulator. So then um, the, the, the nice thing is that there was in this year, um, there has been done a, a new experiment on the forward scattering peak. So this was done in the group around Dominique Delande and uh, Gabriel Limari. And what they did is they, they implemented uh, uh, the, the, the experiment within a cold atom realization of the kicked rotor. And this is now showing the experimental uh, outcome of this experiment. So here the green dots are the uh, coherent backscattering peak. So in the experiment you have some decoherence going on. So they phenomenologically introduced some exponential um, decay due to decoherence. So introduced some phenomenological decoherence time. And then they just used the same decoherence time uh, to, to and added the same exponential decoherence for the uh, forward scattering peak. And this is then showing now the comparison of the experimental results to our theory where they just used the Heisenberg as the only fitting parameter. So this very, I think very nice uh, um, shows like how, how far uh, one is already by really confronting, let's say, our theoretical understanding of endless localization, like the field theory predictions with very controlled experiments. So um, that was the first part. Now in the second part, uh, um, I'll talk about something, um, um, let's say, newer where, where um, 
um, the idea is to see what happens if now some non-trivial topology comes into play. And the motivation for this part is given by some photo photon experiment that was done um, a couple of years ago in the group by Christian Silberhorn. So let me just briefly go through the experiment. So what they did in this experiment, they considered um, polarized photons. So they have um, linearly polarized, horizontally vertically um, uh, uh, photons, which they send thr through some linear optical network. <coughs> network that consists of um, buildings blocks that, that are formed of a polarization plate uh, and a beam splitter with a fiber delay line. So with the polarization plate, they can just rotate um, the, the polarization orientation and the beam splitter is done to separate the photons according to their polarization orientation and then send one of the orientations through an extra fiber delay line separating then the polarizations uh, in time. And if you look at this a bit more closely, you can see that this actually realizes uh, a quantum walk of, let's say, a spin one half particle, uh, where the discrete, where you have discrete time hopping on a 1D lattice, and the single time step evolution operator is given by the product of a translation and a rotation. And this translation is uh, chiral hopping. So you have your walker with an internal degree of freedom, let's say, spin up and spin down. And then your hopping depends on the state, the internal state the walker is in. So if you have the spin up particle, it will hop to the right. If you have the spin down particle, it will hop to the left. And this is implemented in this experiment by the beam splitter in combination with this extra fiber delay line, only that they do the separation in time. Well, and then you have the rotation plates, so, so the, the polarization plates, which just allow for some rotation internal space. And in the actual experiment, what they do then, they place the walker at some lattice point, let's say in this analog, and then uh, just look at the evolution for some time. Let's say you have a, uh, uh, the walk and the spin up state prepared in this uh, lattice site here. Then in the first discrete time step, it will hop to the right, uh, followed by some um, uh, rotation tone state space. So you arrive at some linear combination of spin up and down. So this completes the first time step. In the second time step, then the spin up will hop to the right, spin down to the left. Again, you do, do some, some rotation and applying this uh, iteratively, you get some uh, complicated interference going on. And what you do then in the end is you look uh, at the probability, just uh, the walker's probability distribution that within, let's say, t discrete time steps, it has propagated over some distance x. And the nice thing in this experiment is that they have really full, full control over the polarization plates. So what they did in the experiment, they realized this in three different setups. So in one case, they just uh, implement the polarization plates in a way to mimic constant in space and time disorder, just a fixed rotation. Uh, um, and this means while well, you have a translation invariant system, then the probability distributions for the spin up and down are just uh, ballistically propagating peaks where the mean square distance uh, increases quadratically in time and while propagating to the right and left, depending on the initial uh, uh, internal state. Now, then they realized the same experiment where they now mimicked a spatially varying disorder, constant in time. So they just let um, um, the rotation plates uh, fluctuate around some mean value from side to side. In this case, you introduce disorder in the system. While it's a 1D system, you expect endless localization. That's what they observe here, exponential localization. So the distribution is exponential. Mimic or showing the exponential local endless localization where the mean square distance is just a constant. Um, and in the third case, they realized the experiment now where they also let the rotations fluctuate in time. So in this case, you have you introduced dephasing, so you suppress the interference corrections and uh, end up just with a classical walk where the distribution then takes the form of a Gaussian distribution with a mean square distance with a variance increasing linearly in time. So that's very nice because, um, as said, you have a very good control of this polarization plate, so the internal rotation. And if you look at it in the actual experiment, they don't use all the degrees of freedom that you would have for rotations in this internal space. So you have SU2 matrix, which you can parameterize by three Euler angles, but they don't use all of them uh, independently. So if you look at one case, for example, where you just use two of the Euler angles, um, um, uh, then you'll see that you'll leave some symmetries in the system, which in some cases can be a chiral symmetry. And that's very interesting because if you look at your periodic table for the topological in uh, in 
for the topology insulators, you see that in 1D, system with a chiral symmetry actually allows for z different topology phases. So that's very interesting because this means that this topology number now plays uh, an important role. So the simple single parameter scaling shouldn't apply anymore because you have a second relevant variable, which is the topological number. And this means in this case, you can actually escape the usual fate of uh, strong Anderson localization. And um, uh, yeah, that's then, then, then the idea. I mean, um, to see if they can tune in this experiment. Well, okay, so let, let, let me first go maybe to the two parameter scaling. So, so you can escape like this endless localization uh, if you have the two parameter scaling uh, one when topology plays, plays a role and this is very well understood in the context of the quantum Hall effect. So here's the integer quantum Hall effect. You have the two dimensional electron gas in a strong magnetic field, and what you measure is the linear and the perpendicular resistances. So here's showing experimental data, tuning parameters, the magnetic field. And uh, well, often in these quantum hall systems, well, you have disorder in the system, which means you have broadening of your Landau levels into some impurity bands, and then you have smearing of the gaps. So then what you actually have here is, uh, is Edison insulators. So you see here the resistance or the conductivity uh, uh, is zero, so this would be an insulator which, if this order plays a role, is an Anderson insulator, and you see that uh, these are now all Anderson, insulator, Anderson insulators which are characterized by different uh, Hall resistances, so they are Anderson insulators characterized by different topological numbers. So you have here uh, realization of different topologic Anderson insulators, and if you tune biomagnetic field from one Anderson insul insulator to the next, um, then you pass through a, a, a metallic, a critical metallic phase. And this is summarized in the two parameter scaling here. So you have the conductance and the topological number. And the flow now is as you increase the system size. If you start from generic values for the topological number, you flow to, say, some Anderson insulators with uh, some quantized um, 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 topological number. However, if you fine tune your system to such a critical surface, um, then um, then you have here, in this case, a finite um, uh, conductivity. So the idea then is, um, is uh, if you go then to the 1D uh, photon walk, where you have the chiral symmetry in the system, um, you would expect something similar. And the idea is, well, can we go then and tell the experimentalist to use a, a specific setup to, to tune really into this, let's say, critical phase separating two different Anderson insulators and if you can tune in there um, well can you measure the probability distribution of the walker so can we make some prediction about the probability distribution for the walker and um, in, in the best case compare this then with, with the repetition of, of the experiment. So um, what we then want to do is well we want to develop some effective field theory which allows us to calculate actually the probability distribution of this uh, walker at this, let's say, critical phase or should also first work out the phase diagram. So we want to derive more general a field theory for these Floquet systems, where the Floquet system here consists of a time evolution, single step time evolution operator, which has some deterministic part and some fluctuating part. So in the chiral walk, you have like the chiral hopping and you have uh, the rotations in terms of space which can fluctuate uh, from side to side around some, some common value. So and the first thing you want to identify the relevant degrees of freedom to derive your field theory. And um, the relevant degree of freedom in the context of address localization are always the phase coherent propagation of densities or say the joint propagation of particle and hole amplitude. So um, you want to introduce some matrix field that knows about these uh, amplitudes. And there is a very nice uh, um, um, integral identity known as a color flavor transformation that was introduced a couple of years ago by Martin Sundbauer, which allows you actually to exchange the stochastic part of the time evolution operator, uh, the integral over this, um, um, for an integration over these um, matrix fields, which you can then identify some coordinates of the effective degree of freedom, which again lives in some group or coset space. Uh, so applying this idea of the color flavor transformation, we can derive an effective theory for the disordered uh, chiral walk. So the first term is just the usual um, diffuser sigma model, where now the degree of freedom 
um, is a matrix field in some group, which is actually uh, topology non-trivial. So that's interesting because then you can find a topological term appearing also in the action. So we see that then the action is described uh, by two parameters. So one, let's say the conductance parameterizing the usual diffusive sigma term and then nonlinear sigma term. And then you have the topological term uh, which is parameterized or, or which has a coupling constant which is now the topology number. So indeed you have two parameter scalings and the action follows the same two parameter scaling as the integer quantum Hall system. Um, so there's one more nice thing that, that we uh, what one can see if one derives this um, effective field theory for let's say topological Floquet systems and that's if you look closer at this topological term then you see um, it appears as a product of two contributions. So you have the topological contribution to the action. It depends of, on the field degree of freedom. And the coupling constant of this is given by uh, some number which uh, only depends on, which you can express as some function, which only depends on the stochastic part of the time evolution operator. Now, if you look a little bit more close at this one here, then you see in our case, this is, um, um, a well-known object. This is just a Vesumino term that, for example, appears in the quantization of a spin uh, uh, of the spin. So, so this is um, a well-known term which is um, known actually to be not quantized but multi-valued. Now, to make sense for this, if you exponentiate this with an i in front of it, to make sense uh, of this term, well, the coupling constant of this term has to be quantized, and this is exactly the, 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 the topological term in terms of the uh, field degree of, uh, of, of freedom. And in case, well, of the path integral of spin that just uh, gives them the quantization of the spin. Now, um, you have, so you have this um, um, uh, Vesomino term that then couples uh, to the theta term, which is, um, uh, has the quantized values and depends on, on the effective field degree of freedom. So the interesting thing then is that um, if you want to characterize your, um, let's say, Floquet system by the non-stochastic um, part, then this is not characterized by some quantized um, topological number, but it's in field theory, it's a, it's a Vesomino term, which only under the flow uh, of the integer quantum hall will flow to an integer value. So will flow to an integer value um, or to a half integer if you're in a critical line. So this is actually a feature that we um, observe also if we, so this we just um, saw in, in, in the case of the chiral walk, but one can look at other examples like at the 2D system in, in, in the 2D system without any time uh, without any symmetries. So there again, one can derive an effective the field theory for, for an, an uh, a Floquet system in this case. And again, there will appear topological <coughs> contribution to the action consisting of a Vesomino term, which depends on the non-stochastic part of the time evolution operator coupling to such a theta term in the field degree of freedom. Again, this doesn't have to be quantized, but becomes quantized uh, under the RG flow. So um, then once we have established the, the, the field theory, well, we can work out the phase diagram and see that in this chiral walk, you realize two different Anderson insulators, a trivial one and a topologically non-trivial one. Then one can look at the effective field theory at the critical region and work out the um, probability distribution for the walker. So this is here showing the result. And uh, so the interesting part here is that this probability distribution, so Q is the distance that you propagate within time t. So the, the distance um, is measured in terms of a length scale that uh, increases in time as log square t. So that reflects that you have very slow Sinai diffusion going on at this uh, localization transition. And yeah, so one can work out the, the, the profile of the distribution. Um, and uh, we hope that this uh, will be, will, will be uh, can be measured in future. So then this brings me to the summary and outlook. So first I, I discussed uh, uh, one example of, I think how far we are already to really compare a very nice way like the field theory predictions for Anderson insulators with very controlled called atom experiments. So in this case, um, one could, I one can ex in experiment actually really measure the spectral correlations in a finite size Anderson insulator. And then the second part talked about this uh, critical dynamics at the topology Anderson's uh, localization transition. Hopefully, 
Um, this can be measured with an existing um, um, experiment setup. Now, when uh, looking at this, we saw there are some nice uh, features about the effective topology field theories for for Floquet matter. And while well, the idea is then to go a step, step further, like for example, the experiment that was used here to observe the Korean format scattering peak is this kicked rotor system. And there, th this is very nice systems. If you drive like the system, if you kick the system with several incommensurate frequencies, you can simulate higher dimensional systems. So the idea is one can uh, work out now the field series in higher dimensional, let's say four dimensional uh, in four dimensions, um, look what would be interesting features um, due to non-trivial topology and then translate this back into time correlation functions in the kick water setup and it's something that we're working on at the moment. Okay, so this thing for the intention. So then it's no longer single particle localization, yeah. but it's a collective yeah. localization. But of course, in transport, you'll just see a plateau. Yeah. We are not able to see in the transport. So maybe when you are looking at this regime, yeah. it should hold close to the central point, yes. but not a bit yes. further away. Yes, yes, close to the central part, yes. And it's also, I mean, uh, in, the, in the 1D system also, it's a little bit different than in, in the 2D systems. I mean, the conductance flows to zero instead of... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can ask a question about the first part of your talk. Mm -hmm. So when I saw this picture with the forward scattering peak appearing, I was wondering uh, to what extent uh, this phenomenon uh, is simply a kind of an echo of the other one. Because if you now start time anew, once you have this backward no, scattering peak... But, but it's, uh, you see the time scales, like oh, the, 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 time scales yeah, the, the, the backscattering yeah, peak builds up very quickly on a few elastic scattering time and forward scattering peak really... Yeah, yeah. So, that, so that, that, that means there must be correlations built into the ring part itself, so that uh, if you st start time in you, you get something different, right? Yes, but then also it's a number of, I mean, how many atoms you, you will have then that will sketch, like if you go now from, from the one peak and they sketch and in, in, will back sketch again, I mean, there's a small number. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, and if I see no other question, then maybe I can ask another one. So these uh, uh, log square dependence at, that you yes. found at the very yes, end, yes, 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 yes. Uh, that looks like a Sinai walk, right? Where yes. you also, uh, but it's probably yes. a superficial, a superficial analogy, or is there any relation to, to, to uh, a Sinai walk here? I, I, so, so the Sinai diffusion actually has been also found in, in other 1D topological uh, localization transition. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Okay, then let's thank the speaker again. So it means we're not back on schedule and we meet again at 11.10.